on World News Tonight. Explosive developments. North Korea unveils its most dangerous missile yet in a bid to keep other nations wary of its actions. Tonight, the latest on this nuclear meltdown. Rafa wins. Rafael Nadal claims an emotional 21st Grand Slam title in a fitting end to the long winding Djokovic saga. Tennis fans celebrate despite the separated views on the vaccination status debate. More on the wins and the jabs tonight. Historic visit. Israel and the UAE further strengthens its ties, hoping to set an example to the rest of the weary nations. The two nations having such a visit for the first time in their history. And Beijing lights up. Fireworks light up the sky over China's capital in a spectacular rehearsal ahead of the opening ceremony for the Winter Olympics. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on World News Tonight on the last day of the month of January 2022. Today's broadcast begins with yet more tensions over Ukraine. With tensions between Russia and Ukraine continuing to rise, the United States has decided to escalate its reactions as well, with the country now being close to reaching a deal on legislation to sanction the country in case of invasion and some mechanisms in place to hopefully tackle the situation before it occurs. U.S. Senators are very close to reaching a deal on legislation to sanction Russia over its actions regarding Ukraine, including some measures that may take effect before any invasion, two leading senators said on Sunday. Senators Bob Menendez, the Democratic chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and James Risch, the committee's top Republican, said they hope to move forward on the bill this week. Menendez added that there is strong bipartisan resolve to support Ukraine and punish Russia if it invades. Russia has been building up its forces on Ukraine's borders for months and has demanded NATO pull troops and weapons from Eastern Europe and bar Ukraine from ever joining the U.S.-led military alliance. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky supports immediate action and has criticized the West for waiting to impose more damaging sanctions. The U.S. Senate bill would target the most significant Russian banks and Russian sovereign debt, as well as provide more U.S. military assistance to Ukraine. Menendez said that some of the sanctions could take effect before any invasion by Russia because of what Moscow has already done, including cyber attacks on Ukraine and efforts to undermine the Ukrainian government internally. Meanwhile, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson on Sunday tweeted that the situation is increasingly concerning and urged Russia to engage in negotiations. Johnson said he has ordered British armed forces to prepare to deploy across Europe next week to support NATO allies. The Prime Minister is also due to visit the region this week and will speak by phone to Russian President Vladimir Putin. Alarming news as North Korea has reported a test involving its biggest nuclear missile yet, the last one of its kind being from 2017. This comes as talks concerning South Korea and the United States grow even more tense due to the increasing danger of the weapons created in the North. North Korea confirmed Monday it had tested what's thought to be its most powerful nuclear-capable missile since 2017. It's a move that both the U.S. and South Korea have warned could lead to resumed testing of long-range weapons and nuclear bombs. State media KCNA released these space-based photos of its Hwasong-12 intermediate-range ballistic missile in a test it said was conducted bearing in mind the safety of neighboring countries. South Korea and Japan, however, condemned it as a threat to regional security on Sunday. South Korean President Moon Jae-in said the latest launch brings Pyongyang a step closer to fully scrapping a self-imposed moratorium on its longest-range intercontinental ballistic missiles, which Pyongyang had announced in 2018. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, however, says he is no longer bound by it. Washington shared Seoul's concerns on Sunday, as one senior U.S. official said these latest actions were a means to, quote, increase pressure. That's as Washington has urged Pyongyang to join direct talks with no preconditions. Sunday's launch was the country's seventh missile test in January alone, making it one of the busiest months ever for North Korea's missile program. 
The recent controversy surrounding a certain tennis star has now shifted to an emotional spotlight on yet another. In what most call a fitting end to the Djokovic saga, fellow tennis star Rafael Nadal has claimed a historic win in the Australian Open, allowing for a record 21st Grand Slam title to sit under his belt. Rafa Nadal defeated Russian Daniel Medvedev in the Australian Open men's singles final on Sunday, an historic victory that gave the 35-year-old Spaniard a men's record 21st Grand Slam singles title. Nadal roared back from two sets down to claim the win, only months after fearing his glorious career might be over due to injury. At the post-match presentation, he said, quote, it was one of the most emotional matches in my tennis career. With Novak Djokovic forced out by deportation, having not been vaccinated for COVID-19, and Roger Federer recovering from knee surgery, the tennis great is now one title clear of his big three rivals after winning the match at the Rod Laver Arena. Riding a wave of raucous support from the crowd, Nadal pulled off one of his finest performances to deny Medvedev again, less than three years after beating the Russian at the 2019 US Open final. Having suffered four final defeats in the last decade, Nadal can now savour a second Melbourne Park crown, 13 years after beating Federer in the 2009 decider. Having missed Wimbledon due to fatigue and the US Open because of a chronic condition in his left foot, Nadal was on the brink of quitting in late 2021. But he now joins Djokovic, Rod Laver and Roy Emerson as the only men to win each Grand Slam title twice. Now more than ever, world number one Djokovic may rue his failed bid to defend his title in Melbourne. For the first time ever, the UAE announced a warm welcome for Israeli Head of State President Isaac Herzog. The historic meeting wasn't without turbulence, however, as it was reported during the meeting that the country intercepted Houthi missiles fired from Yemen. A 21-gun salute and the playing of national anthems. Isaac Herzog was given a warm welcome in Abu Dhabi on Sunday, the first time an Israeli president has visited the United Arab Emirates. The two countries normalized ties in 2020 under the U.S.-brokered Abraham Accords. Herzog urged more nations in the region to follow suit. Herzog met with Emirati Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan. In over two hours of talks, the leaders discussed strengthening cooperation on several fronts, including health, technology, investment and trade. Bin Zayed also thanked Herzog for Israel's condemnation of recent missile and drone attacks on the UAE, claimed by Iran-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen. It's a stance that demonstrates our common view of the threat to regional stability and peace, particularly those posed by militias and terrorist forces. Herzog also met with other Emirati officials and on Monday is set to tour the World's Fair in Dubai. His trip comes one month after a visit by Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett to the UAE, also a first. Bin Zayed is expected to travel to Israel at the Prime Minister's invitation. Controversy around the new Taliban rule in Afghanistan just took on more of a grim light as it has been revealed that following the takeover, the group has been responsible for killing large numbers of Afghan officials, focusing on officers that have played a role connected to the United States. A UN report says the Taliban and its allies are believed to have killed scores of former Afghan officials, security force members and people who worked with the international military contingent. Six months after the takeover by the Taliban, Afghanistan is hanging by a thread. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres's report to the UN Security Council paints a picture of worsening living conditions for Afghanistan's 39 million people despite an end of combat after the Taliban's takeover in August. Guterres described the situation as, quote, an entire complex social and economic system shutting down. The report is the latest in a series of warnings the UN chief has issued in recent months about the humanitarian and economic crises that accelerated after the Taliban seized Kabul. 
Guterres recommended the Council approve a restructuring of the UN mission to deal with the situation, including the creation of a new human rights monitoring unit. Despite a general amnesty announced by the Taliban, the UN mission has determined that, since August 15th, more than 100 former officials, security force members, and people who worked for the U.S.-led international military contingent have been killed, over two-thirds of them allegedly by the Taliban or their affiliates. The mission added that, quote, human rights defenders and media workers continue to come under attack, intimidation, harassment, arbitrary arrest, ill-treatment, and killings. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden on Sunday called on the Taliban rulers to release a U.S. civil engineer who was abducted two years ago and is believed to be the last American hostage held by the Taliban. Monday marks the Americans' second year in captivity. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and we'll now move on to the COVID updates around the globe. Canada's vaccine mandate has not sit well with many of its citizens, particularly the truckers of the country, as a large gathering formed of truck drivers completely blocked off roads to Ottawa, leading to the country's parliament to retaliate the mandatory jabs. Trucks lined roadways leading into Canada's capital, Ottawa, on Saturday as drivers staged a massive protest against Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's COVID-19 vaccine mandates. The so-called Freedom Convoy started out days ago as a rally against a vaccine requirement for cross-border truckers. But the protest evolved to a demonstration against government overreach during the pandemic. Scores of trucks from across the country, some of which made it to the city on Friday, lined up in front of Parliament, blowing their horns as thousands of people gathered peacefully on the snow-covered lawn of Parliament. The violent rhetoric used by some of the promoters on social media in the run-up to the protest has worried police who were out in force on Saturday. The CBC reported Trudeau and his family left their downtown home due to security concerns. On Friday, Trudeau told the Canadian press he was worried about possible violence connected with the demonstrations. Earlier this week, he said the convoy represented a small fringe minority who do not represent the views of Canadians. About 90% of Canada's cross-border truckers and 77% of the population have had two COVID vaccination shots. The federal government's health professionals say a more infectious strain of the Omicron variant that arrived from South Africa last month to Australia may soon be dominant in the country. Let's cross over to our Dernabur News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip from Melbourne in Australia for more. Timothy? Yes, I'm Melbourne. Deputy Chief Medical Officer Professor Michael Kidd said it was too early to tell whether the BA2 subvariant caused more severe disease. However, he said if it did, it might be categorized as a new variant. The BA2 subvariant, which some have nicknamed the stealth variant, is growing faster than the original Omicron in some places. Professor Kidd said health officials had not yet seen evidence of more severe disease or reduced vaccine efficacy associated with the subvariant, but stressed it was too early to tell. He said UK health officials reported overnight the BA2 subvariant had a growth advantage over other Omicron subvariants. He also noted that reports from Denmark and elsewhere suggested it may be becoming the dominant subvariant of Omicron. The subvariant has earned the nickname the stealth subvariant because mutations in its genetic code initially made it difficult to detect as a strain of Omicron. Back to you, Anwarthi. Thank you. That was other Dernal World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. This may be the calm before the storm or possibly a plateau of rest for the U.S. healthcare system as COVID infection cases have dropped rapidly in highly affected areas. And hospitals that were once struggling to cope are now sending healthy patients back home, as they usually did. At the Cleveland Clinic ICU, the load was crushing. As one bed emptied, there was another patient right there to fill it. The National Guard and Air Force called in to help. Now, a different story. Across Cleveland Clinic's Ohio hospitals, the number of COVID patients has dropped from 1,200 to 393 in less than a month. Starting next week, elective procedures are back. The National Guard has moved out. 
It's a reflection of the encouraging numbers nationwide, a drop in new cases and hospitalizations down nearly 14 percent. But deaths, which lag behind, continue to rise in some places, with 31 states seeing an increase over the past 14 days. It comes as some places are dropping masks and restrictions. In Denver, the city's indoor mask mandate is set to expire this week. And in Orange County, Florida, the nation's ninth largest school district says starting this week, COVID concerns can no longer be used as an excuse for missing school. Tonight, experts are still cautious, but encouraged. I'm more optimistic today than I have been at any point since the pandemic emerged. We have better tools, better defenses, better information, and better ability to make sure that COVID doesn't dominate our lives. We have the best chance to get and keep the upper hand against this virus. Still in the U.S., the blistering cold soon turned from an inconvenience into a major threat in the northeast of the United States. But the country has slowly begun to pick up the pieces and resurface from underneath the record amount of snowfall. Tonight, millions in the northeast digging out from a dangerous blast of winter weather. Blizzard conditions stretch from the mid-Atlantic to Maine and buried parts of Massachusetts with more than two feet of snow. Boston tying a record for the highest snow total in one day with 23.6 inches. Powerful winds and high waves flooded coastal towns, knocking out power and heat to tens of thousands, just as temperatures dropped 10 to 20 degrees below average. This was Nantucket Saturday, underwater. And today... This is Jason Grazia Day with Nantucket Current. Uh, most of those floodwaters have receded from the streets. There's still some that are iced over and flooded. And after a beating from giant waves, a layer of ice coated these homes along the shore. The snow didn't let up in New York. Paralyzing travel, tractor trailers overturned. Long Island hit especially hard. Officials confirming an elderly man died after falling into an icy pool as he was shoveling snow. As the Arctic air settles in, the Sunshine State is shivering too. This morning, Tallahassee reached just 19 degrees, the first time in a decade. And Floridians are trying to warm up with extra layers. And with lows in the 20s, a rare sight for locals, frozen iguanas. He fell right out the tree, and now he's trying to warm up. Luckily, warmer temperatures are on the way, and the reptiles will spring back to life. France's left wing tries to pick up the pieces as well in the face of an election as the trial and online survey dubbed the People's Primary, composed of popular political figures who will be rated by volunteers on a scale of very good to inadequate. Seven figures selected by voters in a bid to unite France's fractured left wing ahead of April's presidential election. Among the big names, three have been included against their will. The far-left firebrand Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the Greens' Yannick Jadot, and Paris's socialist mayor Anne Hidalgo. They have all refused to be part of any alliance, but their names are still on the list. Christiane Taubira, the former justice minister, is considered the favourite. Many have said that the so-called people's primary was tailor-made for her. She says she will respect the outcome, but she did not say if she would support Jean-Luc Mélenchon if he wins the most votes. Nearly 470,000 people signed up to vote online in the primary. The process is a first in France. Voters are to give each candidate a grade according to several criteria. The highest grade wins. Doubts remain as to whether it will convince the various leftist parties and voters to work together. With 70 days left before the first round of voting on the 10th of April, incumbent centrist president Emmanuel Macron is considered the front-runner, although he has not officially thrown his hat into the ring. His main rivals are the conservative Valérie Pécresse and two far-right figures Marine Le Pen and Éric Zemmour, with Jean-Luc Mélenchon polling in fifth. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. According to final surveys, a late surge by the opposition centre-right PSD party has clawed away the ruling socialist once comfortable poll lead with the two sides in a statistical tie in Poland. 
After coming under fire from rock and folk legends for giving voice to misinformation about COVID-19 vaccines, Spotify will add a content advisory to any podcast episode that includes discussion about COVID-19. Streets turned into rivers in Brazil after heavy rains lashed Sao Paulo state and set off landslides and flooding that killed at least 18 people. Sao Paulo Governor Joao Doria flew over the flooded areas and said he has authorized $2.79 million of emergency aid for the affected cities. Britain begins COVID-19 vaccinations for clinically vulnerable children aged 5 to 11 with a new pediatric formulation of the BioNTech vaccine. The new Pfizer vaccine formulation called Comirnaty received approval from the British government in December. Spain's Sea Rescue Service picked up more than 300 migrants trying to reach the Canary Island in rickety boats, with nine of them clinging to a semi-sunken dinghy. The rescue service said it was unaware of any drownings as reported by a riot school. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other there in English. We're leaving you tonight with a look at a fireworks display that lit up the sky over China's capital Beijing in a rehearsal ahead of the opening ceremony for the Winter Olympics. Thank you for joining us. Good night.